As for our second keynote speaker, he is a professor at the Center for International Studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and currently sits as the faculty regent at the University of the Philippines Board of Regents. He completed his graduate degree in Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Hamburg. He has published on several topics covering the broad fields of Southeast Asian studies, translation, and social science theory. Among his many books and articles include the book Translation and Revolution, a study of results Guillermo Tell, published by the Ateneo de Manila University Press. He also published Pook at Paninindigan, Kritika ng Pantayong Pananaw, published by the University of the Philippines Press. He also writes fiction and recently had a novel, Ang Makina ni Mang Turing, also published by the University of the Philippines uh, Press. Let's listen uh, to Professor Ramon Guillermo. Sir Bowman. Um, at, uh, maraming salamat, Aaron. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, can you hear me? It's the sound okay? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I would like to start with a recent quotation from Professor Alatas <clears throat> uh, from last February. Uh, the view that the Malay language is inferior in terms of being a conveyor of scientific knowledge and rational thought is based on a lack of understanding of the development of languages. The fact that there are many borrowed scientific terms from English does not mean that Malay is an inferior language. The scientific terms of all European languages originate from Greek, Latin, and Arabic. But we would not conclude that English, French, and German, for example, are not adequate as languages of scientific discourse. Uh, this quote is relevant to what follows. Many of the points which I will summarize here have already been outlined in a Filipino language journal article published in Social Science Diliman in 2016, which was my first try at a proposed synthesis of Syed Farid Alatas proposed Autonomous Social Science, or ASS, and Salazar's Pantayong Pananaw, the For Us Perspective, or PP. Though Syed Hussein Alatas was the first to explore the concept of autonomous social science, as applied to the non-Western world, his son, Syed Farid Alatas, distinctive reformulations and further elaborations are rather more widely disseminated and discussed. In fact, the younger Alatas ideas have apparently gained some traction in the Philippines among some proponents of the social science indigenization movement, which crystallized in the 1990s around Pantayong Pananaw and Psikolohiyang Filipino, as well as from some other corners. These ideas are not without any precursors, however. Alata's conceptualization, especially its emphasis on anti-imperialism and national relevance, resonates with many of the writings by the Filipino Marxist historian Renato Constantino. In summary, Alata's very succinct definition of ASS, or Autonomous Social Science, is as follows. An autonomous social science tradition is defined as one which independently raises problems creates concepts and creatively applies methodologies without being intellectually dominated by another tradition. This does not mean that there are no influences from and no learning involved from other traditions. Ideas are not to be rejected on the grounds of their national or cultural origins. One could unpack or elaborate on this definition of an ASS tradition as follows. Number one, it, 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 uh, it independently raises problems. Number two, it creates its own concepts. Number three, it creatively applies existing social science methodologies. Number four, it is not intellectually dominated by other traditions. And number five, it is open to influence from other traditions. Cultural or national origins of ideas cannot serve as the basis for rejecting them. Salazar's PP approach bears some resemblance to these ideas for developing an ASS in the Philippines. However, one should take note that the intended implications of PP go far beyond the social sciences, strictly speaking, but these shall not be delved into here. 20 years ago, I was asked by Salazar to translate his main exposition of PP into English for an issue of the Southeast Asian Journal of so Social Science edited by Alatas on alternative discourses in the social sciences. I shall take Salazar's definitions of PP from there. The core of the Pantayo perspective resides in the internal interrelationships of the interrelating of the characteristics, values, knowledges, aims, customs, behaviors, and experiences of a cultural whole. 
a totality that's, that is enveloped and expressed by means of a language. That is to say, within a sovereign discourse of the kalinangan or culture or kabiasnan civilization. This is a reality within any ethno-linguistic group that possesses wholeness and selfhood here among us and elsewhere in the world. In addition, Salazar writes, in truth, there are many things and concepts that we implicitly understand and interrelate. These and the corresponding behaviors constitute a mentality, a specific and unique thought and way of thinking that a foreigner who has not yet entered a society and culture possessed of a Pantayo perspective will find difficult to understand. To elaborate further, a group of people speaking only about themselves and among themselves may be likened to a closed system or closed circuit, a relating of or relating with closed in upon itself. Everything is understood without the need for referring to any other thing that is outside or external to its cultural context. In sum, a society and culture only has a Pantayo perspective uh, um, if everyone employs concepts and behaviors with meanings that are understood by everyone, even the relationships of these meanings to each other. This can take place if there's only one code or equivalence of meanings, which implies a whole interrelating and, in, and relatedness of meanings, thoughts, and behaviors. The existence of a single language as the basis and transmitter of understanding and communication is important and in reality fundamental. <clears throat> uh, Salazar explicitly references sovereignty in his definition of PP. He describes a closed system of communication based on a single language which subsists without any need to refer outside of itself to be intelligible to its speakers. A foreigner would not be able to enter this world of discourse without learning the language because of the further implication that languages at their core are incommensurable with each other. Such notions of language as holistic and incommensurable entities constitutive of perception, thought, and feeling had already been familiar to Jose Rizal from his readings of German romantics such as Herder and Humboldt. Indeed, for Salazar, it is not enough that one speaks a language. It is also necessary that one should be imbued with a certain mentality corresponding to it. Beyond the emphasis on a single language, seemingly bracketed from other languages, Salazar also stresses the monosemic rather than the polysemic and dialogical aspects of language. The actual diversity of interpretations and conflicts over meaning, which occur even in monolingual societies, seems to have been minimized or glossed over in his account. Salazar asserts programmatically that it is this Pantayo perspective that forms the basis of any Filipinization of the sciences. Given these short excerpts, one could interpret Salazar's position as being closer to outer key or absolute self-sufficiency than autonomy. In Alata's terms, a strongly autarkic reading of PP which rejects the foreign or Western would imply a variant of what he criticizes under the, under the label of nativism in opposition to genuine indigenization. The opposite of autonomy or possessing free will is heteronomy, subjection to the will of another. While the opposite of a closed system, such as that of Salazar, would be an open system. An open system can actually be either autonomous or heteronomous, depending on the balance of forces between the internal and the external. PP therefore has a rather ambivalent, if not antagonistic relationship with the application of what it calls foreign theories to Philippine social and historical phenomena. We will return to this point later, but this second claim brings Salazar quite close to the so-called post-colonial school, perhaps familiar to us from the writings of Vipesh Chakrabarti and, and Gayatri Spivak. One could be tempted to dismiss PP as being anathema to the objectives of a truly autonomous social science though a better way of understanding PP might be to represent it as occupying the whole range of between what Alatas calls indigenization and nativism. However, uh, there are elements in PP which uh, seems to deserve further explicitation and emphasis. And these uh, elements seem to be uh, missing or not explicit in the basic formulations of ASS or Autonomous Social Sciences at present. The first is the linguistically based idea of discursive community or communication community, which operates on the basis
basis of a mutually intelligible language. In PP, this language of social science is also the everyday language of a wider, possibly national community. The second element related to the first is the claim that since one of the tasks of social science is to understand how people perceive or experience their world, it's important that these processes of understanding be done in the languages of and using the concepts of the national communities themselves. The program of PP therefore advocates the use and development of national or other languages as vehicles of social science, research, and dissemination. We will discuss the possible reformulations of autonomous social sciences building on these two aspects of PP, which we may call an autonomous social science communication community. By inserting language within the ASS model, another dimension in the measurement of autonomy is opened up, and that is to say in the bibliometric field. This approach, not uncontroversially, would take journal articles as the basic unit of production within a social science tradition. At the present time, it is quite clear that Europe and North America, which published a combined 82% of all journals in the world from 1998 to 2007, dominate the globe in terms of the number of journals published. This state of affairs gives rise to the distinction in social science publishing between those which are central and those which are peripheral. Another aspect of this dominance can be seen in the main languages of social science journals. According to Thomson Social Science Citation Index data, 94.45% of all social science articles published in 98, 19, from 1998 to 2007 were in English. German was a far second with only 2.14%. The only Asian languages in the top 10 are Chinese and Japanese. Most interestingly, by looking at citation data, Yves Jingra and Sebastian Mosba Nathanson in 2010 are able to propose a way of measuring the degree of autonomy or dependence of the so-called peripheral, peripheral regions from Europe and North America. They were able to determine that Africa, with more than 50% of its citations coming from European journals in the period 2003 to 2005, is largely a European dependent region. On the other hand, Asia and Latin America are generally North America dependent, with more than 50% of their citations coming from North American journals in the same period. North America, with around 80% self citations, and Europe, with 50% self-citations are largely autonomous regions of social science production. Uh, self-citation here, self here means when uh, a journal cites another journal or a journal article cites another journal article in the same region in North America itself. So that is here considered as a self-citation. And as we can see in North America, journals are pred predominantly cite only those journals which appear also in North America. One of the striking downsides of the autonomy of the United States in intellectual production is that the number of translated works published in what is today the largest book market in the world hardly breaches 3%. That was in 2017 of total book production. This contrasts with Germany, Italy, and France, where the figure ranges from 12 to 15% with translations from English, however, accounting for around 60% of the total. It seems that this kind of autonomy, for the most part, only listens to its own voice and doesn't need any input from any other place. Another approach to looking at this uh, so-called uh, global intellectual dependency is by looking at the patterns of research collaboration on a global scale. Ian Calvert and Daniel Hook are developing a way of mapping the patterns of collaboration among scientists. Although the data they use is from Overleaf, a cloud-based editor which aims to facilitate collaborative scientific writing, mainly in the natural sciences, which was launched in 2012, their findings are perhaps indicative of the current global situation. The top five countries which are most connected to all other nations in the map of scientific collaborations are the United States, United Kingdom, France, Spain, and Germany. Indeed, uh, research gate map visualizations show, for example, that researchers from the National University of Singapore, University of Malaya, University of Indonesia, 
Chulalongkorn University and Vietnam National University most often collabor collaborate with institutions in Europe, Australia, East Asia, and the United States, rather than with those in their neighboring Southeast Asian region. It, it, it's, apparently, it's only the University of the Philippines which seems to engage in a more or less substantive, substantial research collaboration with other Southeast Asian universities, though even these are relatively small in number. Strongly co collaborative work or strongly collaborative networks are able to generate autonomous scientific con communities, even at the level of regions. But these are still lacking in Southeast Asia. These great imbalances between the centers and peripheries of social science production is connected to the prevailing patterns of global research collaboration. The high rate of self-citation in the autonomous centers of social science production is partly due to the greater intensity of intercollaboration of research institutions in those regions. This state of affairs, which owes its existence to a great extent to the neoliberal rankings of universities, with its emphasis on such metrics as citation rates, age indices, and impact factors, makes the contemporary pr project of pursuing an autonomous social science much more difficult than it probably was three or four decades ago. The dominance of journals from the global centers of knowledge production will continue to act as a structural constraint among scholars to conform with the concepts, subject matters, theories, and methodologies which prevail in the journals of the center. Research trends emanating from Europe and North America will dictate publishability in journals rather than questions of national or community relevance of social science research. Aside from questions of relevance, the accessibility of social science production in languages intelligible to the broader national publics, publics which is a matter of crucial importance in the democratization of science and in the functioning of, a, functioning of a genuinely democratic polity will conceivably be relegated even greater to the background. The challenge of creating a counterbalance towards an autonomous social science communication community in Southeast Asia and other so-called peripheral regions must take into account all these matters of journal publication, languages of research, citation behaviors, and international research collaboration. And I think uh, uh, Professor Alata's point earlier about the question of seeking recognition or the dialectic recognition uh, of, the, of, the, of the global south uh, with respect to the global north is also relevant here. However, another central topic is still the question of the sources of originality of such a, an autonomous communication community in the social sciences. Much has been written about the wealth of concepts to understand the world which are ready to hand in the great variety of non-Western languages. There is much potential here for developing a much more contextually sensitive social science theorization, which Alatas refers to as alternative discourses, which, which allow the creation of theories, theory building, and concept formation on an alternative basis than that which is dominant today. However, in developing an autonomous social science, which remains connected but not subservient to other traditions, the example of Marx and Marxism is unusually instructive. Both Salazar's Pantayan Punanao and post-colonial theorists like Deepesh Chakrabarti have developed similar critiques of Marxism, which accuse it of being a Eurocentric mode of thought or theory incapable of capturing the realities of non-Western societies. Their prescription, therefore, has generally been to turn away from Marxism in understanding the modern non-Western world. Vivek Chibber's detailed and comprehensive attack on post-colonial theory, which he wrote in, which he published in 2013, in defense of class analysis, Marxism as a theoretical system, is admirable and necessary, but perhaps lacking in dialectical nuance. Chibber much too easily brushes aside the messy matters of culture and language in favor of a ringing anti-culturalist call to arms to universal enlightenment ideals. In the end, in Chibber's work, it seems that everything that matters has already been said. It is as if insofar as the thinking and the thinking through of the ideals of liberation are concerned, all the work has already been done. The best way to restore the dialectic to this 
is perhaps by citing Hegel himself in the so-called uh, introduction, in the introduction to the so-called larger logic, Hegel wrote, anyone who in our time labors at erecting a new an independent edifice of philosophical sciences may be reminded, thinking of how Plato expounded his, of the, of the story that he re reworked his Republic seven times over. The reminder of this, any comparison such as may seem implied in it should only serve to incite ever stronger the wish that for a work which as belonging to the modern world is confronted by a profounder principle, a more difficult subject matter, and the material of greater compass, the unfettered leisure had been afforded of reworking it seven and 70 times over. So Hegel says that he wishes that like Plato, he had had the opportunity to write and rewrite his work. And not, not just seven times as Plato did with the Republic, but 70, 77 times. To describe the process of rewriting, Hegel uses the, uses the German verb durch zu arbeiten, which literally, literally means to work through, work through. This means that he wanted to write and rewrite his work from beginning to end, repeatedly and iteratively. As far as the writing and rewriting of Marcus works is concerned, faced as we are today with an even profounder principle an even more difficult subject matter and a material of even greater compass. One of our tasks is to work through Marx again and again, iteratively, from beginning to end, generating autonomous readings, receptions, translating, translations, and interpretations, such that the books he wrote remain his and yet are no longer his own, but also equally ours. One example of this rewriting, writing and rewriting, is the concept of equality, which, which uh, spread throughout the world after the French Revolution. In the earlier days, Toussaint Louverture in Haiti rewrote Egalité, and he rewrote it in the interests of the anti-slavery revolts. Rizal rewrote Egalité again in the name of the Filipino Indios. Radin Ajeng Kartini in Indonesia rewrote Egalite in the name of the women in, in Indonesia. Mao Zedong wrote, rewrote Egalite once again until 1949, the victory of the Chinese Revolution. In French, Egalite is still the same word, but its meaning has changed in the past 200 years. It will still change in the next 200 as it, as it is worked through again and again. This means that much work remains and that the last word has not been said in the science of understanding and changing our societies. Uh, thank you, I think that's all. All right, thank you, uh, Professor Guillermo for your paper. Uh, we've, have, we ha we've been receiving uh, some questions through chat and through uh, the Q&A portion. Maybe we can start off with you uh, responding to one of them, uh, it, the, the anonymous attendee asked, uh, how can we uh, get away with the academic dependency of journal publishing if it is you know, required in the university setting? Can you make a comment on that? How can we break this citation dependency? Um, well, uh, there is, of course, uh, at present, we generally have to negotiate with this kind of uh, reality. But we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We shouldn't go, go all out in that direction because uh, it means that, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, we can actually balance at the, at the present time our production so that um, we can um, publish some works in, in these foreign journals, in these, journal, in, this, in these journals of the center, and yet also publish in Philippine journals and also try to publish articles in, in our languages, not just in English. Hmm. But this is just a way of negotiating with current realities. But this reality, I think, uh, can still be uh, modified, can still be changed. I think in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in the Philippines, we have to develop the 
logistics and the infrastructure for strengthening uh, our journals and strengthening collaborative work among the intellectuals and scholars of this area, of this region. So it's a matter of also pursuing uh, a new mode of uh, intellectual collaboration and production in our countries and in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is, uh, as of this moment, already the ASEAN Citation Index, which tracks citations within uh, Southeast Asia. And that's meant to sort of uh, be a counterbalance to the uh, European American Citation Indices. But unfortunately, it is not uh, really popular. It's not being used, except for Thailand. Not many of the countries in Southeast Asia are actually making use of the ASEAN Citation Index. I think we should uh, uh, be more serious with uh, how we uh, uh, engage uh, with these kinds of uh, potentially uh, fruitful uh, projects. So um, I think uh, there is a way that we can actually uh, constitute or reconstitute uh, uh, intellectual and academic production in the Philippines, which allows us uh, a better position uh, and uh, as opposed to uh, being uh, completely submissive to the uh, global uh, publication mechanism or system. All right. I think that also answers uh, another question about uh, the challenge of having Philippine concepts uh, diffused uh, more internationally. Uh, we need uh, institutional and regional infrastructure to support uh, publications. Uh, another question from RAC. I wonder if this is Professor Romel Kurami. Make yourself known if this is you, sir. Uh, he says, I wonder if the idea of autonomous social science merely hides the powers and interests from the periphery that seek to install themselves as the new center that in due time will peripher peripherize others, thus just duplicate the logic of unequal power relations. What do you think about this? Uh, well, um, um, well uh, I've already shown showing uh, with using uh, certain statistics in bibliometric analysis that uh, the so-called global south is extremely marginalized in terms of uh, academic intellectual uh, production on a global scale so the matter is whether we should accept this or not and what we can do uh, to move forward now if one uh, means of uh, moving forward is by developing uh, autonomous uh, social science traditions, then uh, uh, it is, it is uh, probably worthy of our support. But I also uh, emphasize, I also wish to emphasize that there is a greater objective behind um, this uh, idea of autonomous uh, social science. And I think Professor Alatas will agree with this. He, he, uh, he, he mentioned earlier that, uh, social, that writers in the social sciences uh, actually have objectives when they uh, make their studies. And one um, main objective of autonomous social science, in my view, is to involve uh, the people, to democratize uh, knowledge and science, to disseminate uh, information and, and theories among uh, the broader uh, public, something which is uh, quite difficult in our elitist uh, mode of uh, intellectual production. So. Uh, uh, Professor Latas mentioned earlier that you know the, you know, it, it, for 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 some universities it doesn't matter whether your 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 um, countrymen or and women read you. Hmm. All that matters is that you're cited in, in in North America. That's not the objective of uh, of autonomous social science. The objective of autonomous social science in in, cre in the creation of communication communities is also to create critical communication communities. Communication communities which are able to, to develop a critical perspective on societies and are able to mobilize people to create changes in these societies. So um, uh, um, uh, autonomous social sciences has a much more ambitious project than just, uh, you know, than just getting us promoted uh, and get up the ranks, you know. In, in our uh, academic uh, institutions. All right, oh. sir, another Aaron, question. Aaron, could, may, I, may I also uh, uh, make a comment or ask a question? Sure, Professor Alatas. Oh, thank you. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Guillermo for, you know, for your uh, presentation and, and for um, taking my own work uh, seriously. Um, um, I myself benefited, you know, from um, several pieces you have written on, on Rizal, which I'm, I'm working on right now. Um, um, more, more, I think I've, I've read something uh, just recently about um, Rizal's views about um, racism, which you wrote about, I think, in Philippine studies and some other papers as well. Um, I'll probably contact you to uh, discuss those matters further. Um, but I'm, uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, I, I'm grateful that you uh, raised the issue of language because that is very, uh, very important. Um, uh, we need to go beyond the, the simplistic, um, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> claim that if you speak in English, then you are contributing to coloniality. Um, um, language is important. Um, I think first, first of all, we need to understand that one can be thoroughly Eurocentric and not speak a word of English. So you can write um, as many um, scholars, for example, in, in Indonesia, they write only in Indonesian language, but they are thoroughly Eurocentric in their outlook. On the other hand, you can write in English and be anti-colonial. Um, but having said that, I agree with you that language is crucial because we need to go beyond language as merely a means of translation. Language is a repository of concepts and ideas. Um, there are, you know, um, you know, for example, um, in Malay and Indonesian, people often translate migration as migrasi, right? Um, forgetting that there are terms in Malay and Indonesian which not only refer to the movement of peoples, but connote a different understanding of the movement of peoples. Um, in, in Malay, for example, we have two words. One is marantau and the other one is hijra. Now, these two words both refer to movement of peoples, but they refer to different concepts because they refer to different phenomena as far as the movement. Marantau refers to movement of people within a cultural area, whereas hijra, but hijra refers to movement outside uh, from uh, movement um, to an area that's outside your cultural area. Um, so, but right now we're looking at language very instrumentally. It's just a means of translating um, English, uh, uh, you know, works in English or concepts or terms in English into our languages, but not as a repository of, uh, of language, uh, a repository of uh, concepts and ideas. So I, I agree very much with you that if we talk about autonomous social science, we need to um, you know, to um, to take um, to I, the way you put it was insert language into autonomous um, social science, meaning that our discourse on decolonization needs to talk more about um, language. But uh, with regard to that, I'd like to ask you. Um, um, I, I'm not very certain about uh, you know how you know Filipinos are to to some extent like the Indians that you know English is. Uh, Filipino language, I guess. Um, so what is the politics of language in the Philippines as far as this idea of decolonizing knowledge is, is concerned? Um, well, um, um, we, have, we have a very complex uh, linguistic situation in the Philippines, as you well know, and solutions aren't really easy. Uh, you know, our Filipinos have been trying to uh, propose and uh, develop solutions in this situation mm -hmm. for several decades already. And um, I think um, uh, Pantai Pananao had its own uh, solution, which is actually to, uh, to champion the national language as the, uh, uh, maybe the sole language of uh, social scientific pro production in the Philippines. Uh, but maybe uh, I've already discussed this in another work and it's written in Filipino. Uh, I would say that maybe it's time that uh, we recognize a, the uh, actually multilingual aspect of, uh, of these uh, post-colonial societies that we live in, such that uh, the, the question is not um, actually preeminently the, the, the matter of what language we are using, but the question of intertranslatability and mutual intelligibility between uh, the scientific communities which use uh, these uh, languages. 
So I would, uh, I would try to propose a kind of protocol of uh, scientific uh, communication uh, using particular uh, languages in the Philippines. Although, of course, the main academic languages that we have been using um, are uh, English and Filipino as a whole. Uh, there are still other languages in the Philippines which could have be candidates for further uh, development as academic and research uh, languages. Uh, many languages in the Philippines are spoken by far more people than many countries in Europe. So uh, I think uh, it's just a matter of uh, having faith uh, in, 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 the, um, in the potential uh, of, of, of their languages, which I think this faith uh, has vanished because of uh, uh, the intellectual dependency, the, the, the things that you uh, speak of. And um, I think we should uh, encourage this faith again. So uh, of, of course, one problem if, uh, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not an exponent of uh, linguistic anarchy so that everyone just goes and talks whatever and speaks any, uh, anything that they want. Because in, in, in fact, uh, developing uh, social science uh, uh, languages in a, in a specific language, also other disciplines is quite difficult. Indonesia uh, had spent decade, decades trying to develop uh, this uh, capacity. So uh, it's not easy to develop that in a specific language, not in all languages. But we have to try to at least recognize the multilingual aspect of our societies and try to inscribe this into our practices of, uh, of uh, social science uh, research. Now, if, if we speak of English, of course, there is, uh, there is a uh, reading public in the Philippines uh, who can understand English, who can uh, speak English. But in my view, the great majority cannot actually uh, deal with English on, on that plane. It's a minor minority that finish college were able to understand uh, these, uh, these works. We have to address the need of the broader uh, population so that the, the results of social scientific work can also benefit them, can also be part of uh, our democratic policy, of the strengthening of, uh, of our uh, democratic uh, practices in our country. So um, um, uh, people speak of a kind of uh, bifurcated readership in the Philippines that um, when you read English, you read only English. And when you read Filipino, uh, well, uh, you read Filipino and English, right? But this bifurcation is something that we should also try to overcome because it reduces the size of our book market also that, you know, if you you just publish in English, and this small uh, readership will, will read that. And if you publish it, you know, another small readership will read that. It, it affects uh, book publish, publishing and also the publishing of other materials. All right. Thank you uh, for that question, Professor Alatas, and the response from uh, Professor Guillermo. Uh, Sir Bowman, there's a question here. Uh, that reads, I noticed that the speakers were using the term modern as a marker of historical time. For example, uh, modern Southeast Asia, pre-modern Islamic tradition. I would like to ask, doesn't using modern as a chronological marker perpetuate Eurocentric conceptions of time? Is there a way for us to subvert the historical colonial baggage of the term modern, given that pre-modern was equated to quote-unquote primitive during the colonial era? So we can apply it to the histories in the global south, or should we avoid using the term altogether? Actually, I'm more interested in what uh, Professor Alatas has to say about this. Uh, maybe I can add something after he uh, he uh, he can if he wants to reply. All right, Professor Farid, would you like to make a comment on that? Yeah, all right. It's kind of it's like an ambush, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, well. I, I don't think that um, our using the term modern is, um, you know, is a reflection of our being Eurocentric. Um, it, 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 more, it has more to do with whether we believe that there's such a thing as a modern period. Um, uh, for me, um, the, you know, for me, it's an objective reality that there is something called modernity. There is um, uh, something called modernity that began in Europe. Um, and it involves um, a certain way of thinking. It involves um, 
a new way of organizing our lives, which we call capitalism, you know, hence the term modern capitalism. Um, and that this um, um, modernity in this sense uh, gradually encro encroached upon and encompassed um, increasing uh, parts of the, of the globe. Um, much of it done through colonialism. So we were incorporated into modern uh, um, capitalism um, and um, for, for decades or centuries, um, we, um, you know, we were subject to a system called, uh, which we might call colonial capitalism. Um, I don't think it's being Eurocentric uh, to, you know, to um, think along those uh, terms. What, what is Eurocentric is our assessment of the system, our conceptualizing, conceptualization of it, um, um, the 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 mo the way in which we engage in knowledge production to deal with uh, colonial uh, capitalism or modern capitalism or modernity, and the kind of politics that we engage in, but um, the acceptance or rejection of the idea of modernity, I think, uh, is is a conceptual issue and and. If we believe that there is such a thing as a modern period, there's such a phenomenon as uh, modernity, then um, um, to me, it is not, uh, you know, a result of um, the acceptance of it is not, um, you know, it is not a matter of being Eurocentric. Uh, it's not a matter of accepting the values of modernity. It's not a matter of accepting uh, the system in a normative sense. Uh, it is an empirical. Um, matter, uh, uh, you know, a conceptual matter of whether we believe there is such a thing historically uh, and objectively, is there such a thing as modernity? Um, uh, so Great. I Thank you. I, I will add. Okay. So um, I, I did write. Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. Uh, coming from uh, having uh, uh, been uh, trained in Pantayong uh, Pananaw under uh, Professor Salazar, me some some time actually to come to terms with the um, term modern because um, one can imagine that uh, that would be a popular um, idea among uh, advocates of uh, Antayong Pananaw. But nevertheless, in the test trip to uh, Zeus uh, Salazar, I wrote an essay and the, the title was had a uh, uh, well, it, it, the title mentioned uh, capitalist modernity. So, uh, and I tried to detail there uh, the matter of uh, capitalist modernity. So not just modernity itself, but capitalist uh, modernity. And uh, very crucial to my uh, discussion or understanding of this uh, capitalist modernity is a contribution by a Latin American philosopher. His name is uh, Bolivar Echeverria. He's not very well known outside of, uh, outside of South America. But uh, his formulation of capitalist modernity in relation to the cultural, economic, and social crisis in South America induced by colonialism and capitalism, I think, has a great um, bearing upon uh, the Philippine experience. And, um, and he uh, refers to the ethos, different ethos of modernity. It's how it's that modernity is here, but the ma the question is how do we respond? How do we live it? And the way that we live modernity, in fact, is uh, something that is our own, something that we bring into uh, modernity, something which transforms modernity itself. So um, um, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe we can also extend uh, expand our readings on modernity beyond what has been written by Europeans about modernity. Why don't we study what what uh, people from uh, the global south also have written been written about modernity and have theorized, have philosophized about it, and that really gave me uh, a lot of uh, ideas to continue this uh, discussion on in the Philippine context. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, since I, I just would like to go back to uh, the citations and journal indices that you discussed extensively a while ago. There is a question here. Uh, that asked, how could the system of copyright uh, induce the westernization of knowledge and the derailment of an autonomous social science? Perhaps uh, this could lead into discussions on open source, open data, and, and whatnot. Can you make a comment on this, sir? 
uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, we, we have quite a problem with copyrights in the University of the Philippines at this very moment uh, because uh, we have switched to uh, online uh, teaching at the University of the Philippines because of the pandemic. And uh, we have had to create course packs. So in, in these course packs, we are supposed to put in all the learning materials that we wish to send to our students so that uh, you know, the, the semester can proceed as planned. However, uh, the UP administration cautioned us that we should not include anything in the course packs which uh, are copyrighted materials or materials for which we have not yet received the license or permission to distribute. So uh, what happens is that we had a very big problem with uh, uh, you know, uh, putting together these course packs because we had no time to actually ask uh, publishers and writers to, for permission to use their works. And, uh, and there is no assur assurance from the University of the Philippines that we would be even legally uh, supported if, uh, we are, if, if people complain against our usage of uh, copyrighted materials. So what happens is there will be a massive effect on, I think, on the quality of education in, in UP because uh, we, we are not allowed to include uh, readings and uh, materials which we think uh, are important. So the students uh, can, uh, you know, can learn effectively during this pandemic. So that's already one uh, one uh, problem in 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 the distribution of uh, of knowledge of the restriction of the distribution of knowledge. I think uh, I think uh, you know uh, there are already proposals to develop uh, new intellectual regimes of copyright uh, regulation, and uh, we I think I fully support. Uh, these proposed changes, which reduce, do not abolish copyright, but reduce the hold, uh, the, risk, the hold these copyrights have over us, and the the the, uh, the restrictions, especially the restrictions uh, which last for many years for using uh, copyrighted materials, and um, uh, we we in the global south should be supportive of uh, of uh, initiatives in the area of open stores open knowledge, open communication of information, because this redounds to our uh, benefit as, uh, as communities. So um, um, it's, it's a matter of activism also in the, in the field of, uh, of knowledge production and dissemination. And I think we should uh, support journals which are you know, uh, published and uh, really accessible to everyone and, uh, and, don't, and, and uh, don't hide behind these very expensive paywalls so uh, I think a lot of academics are already pissed. A lot of academics are already, you know, very angry at this situation and uh, the restriction of the free flow of information and uh, knowledge. So uh, I think a new order of uh, knowledge flows will have to come from uh, this. Right. So I think that answers one of the questions he raised, uh, uh, inquiring whether there is a way out to... Uh, the Western postmodern, postcolonial capitalist mo modernity uh, imposed uh, by the global north. Uh, I think we need to also, as you've mentioned, uh, be more active in advocating uh, a way out. Or, and then I would like to relate that to another question, quite a big question raised uh, in the chat box. It, the, 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 the student asked, uh, how can Orientalist discourse survive uh, Eurocentric, I think, or maybe Oriental discourse, survive the Eurocentric onslaught of knowledge in terms of the Westphalian domination of international politics? Could we come up with a grand project uh, to, or a narrative to eulogize Orientalism? Or maybe I'd like to paraphrase the question. Can we come up with a way to how do we come up with an alternative to, to the Eurocentric mode of thinking that is dominant right now? Uh, it's, uh, mm. uh, well, I think uh, Professor Alatas would have something to say about that. He's been <laughs> writing about it for, thir for decades. <laughs> I'm also interested in what he would say. Mm. Well, Sir, um, okay. I, I, I thought I thought that is what we have been talking about all this while, mm. isn't it? I mm. mean, the, the, the question is is uh, asking about um, the answer to that question has been this, the, the the topic of 
our you know talks and discussions during the last uh, couple of hours. Um, but but since uh, the question mentioned uh, the Treaty of uh, or it mentioned Westphalia um, and um, the international the, the political order, um, I, I think we you know we have been clear about what we mean by decolonial knowledge or uh, anti-colonial knowledge or you know autonomous social science, um, uh, alternative discourses and so on, um, and and how um, these um, um, forms of knowledge um, uh, are, are non-orientalist uh, or non-eurocentric, um, but uh, I think it's necessary also to say that our interest in doing this um, is not simply for the sake of an alternative form of knowledge production, but it has also to do with the way we live in the world, because it's not only knowledge production that is eurocentric; the world itself is eurocentric. I mean, the world itself, the way the world is, the way the world functions, economically and political, politically, it revolves around Euro-America, right? You know, the international order that we live in, the, um, the, 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 the uh, um, dominant financial instruments, um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that we use the US dollar, um, the um, major in institutions such as the United Nations, um, uh, the World Bank, and so on. Um, much of our world revol revolves around um, Euro-America. Um, and we need non-Eurocentric knowledge, not just for the sake of alternative knowledge production and not just for, you know, um, aesthetic reasons of, you know, looking at alternative traditions of knowledge uh, production, alternative sources of concepts, not just for that, but also because we need to know about what are possible ways of living in the world in a different way. That's why there is an interest, there's a growing interest over the decades, you know, in indigenous um, uh, knowledge. And I mean, I'm talking about the knowledge produced by so-called indigenous first nation people, um, because they have knowledge about how we, for example, deal with um, environment. They have knowledge about, um, you know, for example, there's literature on um, Thai Buddhist uh, uh, ecology, um, which provides a different understanding and a different way of uh, living um, with nature, living with, uh, you know, um, with the forest. Um, um, and, um, you know, you have movements um, uh, in Thailand, uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka, throughout Latin America that are seriously looking at these non-eurocentric ways of um, not only understanding the world but you know how we can reorganize and rearrange our economic and political um, lives um, in, a, in a different way um, so there's a very practical reason to be interested in um, uh, you know non-eurocentric uh, ways of thinking yeah um, I would add to that um, that uh, maybe there's also a difference between um, what we might call a, um, a passive uh, universal and an active uh, universal. The passive universal would be accepting the so-called universal as a given. And, um, and that is exactly what uh, the Eurocentric uh, mode of thought wants us to uh, do, to accept the universality of Eurocentrism as a given. And yet for us, it is not a genuine uh, universal. We have to work through it in Hegel's sense in order to attain or work uh, towards greater uh, universality. But that, uh, you know, the, 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 the end goal of the real universal, that, that, that will come as long as human history exists. But we work on these materials and develop them and, you know, we make things more uh, genuinely and truly universal than, than they were before. So I mentioned earlier the concept of egalité in France in the French Revolution. Uh, for the French, that would mean something. But the, the, the revolutionaries which came later, who took over this term, transformed egalité. And it no longer means what it meant to the French. Hmm. By working over, over uh, equality, by transforming it, by receiving it, by changing it, by saying it in their own tongues, it transforms and it becomes 
a, uh, a more genuine universal. And yet this more genuine universal is the process of unending, uh, unending rewriting and rereading and labor. So um, it had to go through the women's movement. It had to go through the anti-slavery movements. It had to go through the anti-colonial movements. It had to go through the socialist movements of the 20th century. And in our time, it will still go, it will still be worked through again and again. And, mm. and this is an unending process. So I think uh, that's how we should think of overcoming uh, mm. Eurocentric, uh, uh, the Eurocentric uh, mode of thought, that kind of universal. All right. No? So I'd like to end uh, your session with this particular question. Uh, the question raises the point that uh, post-colonial studies uh, is very much uh, going hand in hand with class analysis as well. Uh, the 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 one who asked the question would like to point out that post-colonial studies is also about the continuity of colonial structures of of oppression uh, in the new states that were formed. Uh, hence. Uh, the question was, can engaged scholarship or engaged social science truly help marginal people, marginalized people to speak and have their voices heard? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, maybe I'd like to extend that further since... I, hmm. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, go, go. Well, uh, I was... Um, well, uh, this is, of course, a contested um, hmm. area of interpretation. I just referred to a, the particular um, variants of uh, subaltern studies for colonial thinking represented by uh, Chakrabarty and Spivak. And even the interpretation of these authors uh, is contested. But uh, I should think that uh, Chibbers, uh, we should read his book. Uh, I, well, I forgot the title, it's uh, Post Colonial uh, Spectre of post-colonialism, something that uh, is very important in trying to define a, uh, a field of uh, debate around this matter. And Chibber's view, after an analysis of uh, these, uh, of these uh, subaltern uh, authors, is that uh, they have relegated um, class analysis to irrelevance because they wanted to understand oppression and uh, resistance to oppression uh, using um, idioms which are unique and uh, inseparable from certain cultural uh, and linguistic uh, contexts in India uh, in particular. So uh, uh, that was, I think, uh, a central uh, aspect of the debate um, between Chibber and the uh, proponents of uh, subaltern studies. Uh, and yet, I think, uh, although I think Chibber has something there and uh, and um, he even wrote an article on, on how uh, class analysis has been marginalized in India because of uh, subaltern studies, has in fact vanished because of the influence of uh, this, uh, this school, which used to be a Marxist uh, uh, tradition in India. And uh, one could talk about the Philippine case also. I mentioned Renato Constantino earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, Renato Constantino has almost uh, disappeared from the Philippine intellectual firmament because of indigenization, because they viewed uh, Renato Constantino as being Marxist and therefore yeah. foreign, therefore yeah. inapplicable to the Philippines, etc. The, th the same thing actually happened uh, in the Philippines. <laughs> and and uh, I also wrote a book about it, about, uh, about uh, Antayang Pananaw and uh, Marxism, right? But um, uh, so I think, uh, but Chibber, I think, uh, goes overboard and that he <laughs> dismisses uh, the whole uh, problem of uh, of, uh, of language and uh, and culture and uh, the, and uh, let's say uh, sick description, he dismisses the whole thing, and mm. he so suddenly goes into some kind of enlightenment jibber jabber. That's what uh, critics said, and uh, I think it's because it's insufficiently dialectical uh, that uh, his concept of um, of the universal is already a fixed universal that you know that should just come to us one day you know and uh, it's not that we're going to work through this universal and transform it change it fundamentally by our working through mm. so uh, 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 that's that's where I think uh, 
Chiber goes uh, overboard. And I think I recommend everyone read uh, uh, that book. You know? And um, on the other hand, uh, so I'm just saying that, you know, there's this debate and, and, uh, and they say that one interpretation says that class analysis was marginalized because of mm. uh, subordinate studies. And also in the Philippines, the same thing I think happened. And then uh, if you go to, uh, let's say, uh, um, what was the last ask question? Uh, the uh, engaged, uh, mm. engaged social science, engaged anthropology. I think uh, that is one aspect of what I was, I was calling earlier a critical communication community that should be part of this autonomous uh, social science. Of course, not all aspects of autonomous social science could be considered um, you know, involved in this critical communication community. But the critical communication community is not just made up of, you know, social scientists and academics. It involves ordinary people. It involves activists on the ground. It involves uh, indigenous peoples in the construction of uh, uh, their, uh, that kind of uh, social science. So that um, it is essential uh, that uh, this critical communication community um, uh, should, uh, in the end, actually, uh, pursue the rights and interests and the welfare of these communities. Of mm -hmm. what uh, value would there would there would this kind of interface between academics, social scientists, and um, and uh, and the people on the ground you know, be if they did not produce uh, any kind of effect on society? So I think uh, um, that there there is a call. There is a call actually to be engaged. To be involved in these critical uh, social scientific areas of study, but one aspect of the dominance of uh, of the um, let's say the uh, neoliberal university of the, of the of the of the academics who now want to market themselves beyond in, in, in the in in the West no? in the Euro American uh, context they, they they don't they can't do that because uh, that's not part of what uh, uh, what is expected of you by the um, by the uh, centers of academic production in in um, in the in the centers? What they want you to, to do is to mimic them, to mimic their theories, mimic their problems, mimic their um, frameworks and theories. That's the best thing you can do so that you will get published. You know, so that uh, you know they say, oh, this is very good. It's it's, it's mm. trendy. It's it's relevant to us, right? I'm not. Right. I'm not discouraging people from do, from publishing. You know, I'm just saying that. You know, maybe we can modify it a bit. Yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> be more uh, Aaron, yes, Aaron, sir. Can I can I can I just very quickly add add to that? Uh, yes, sir. That, that, uh, my <clears throat> my my father, who uh, proposed this idea of autonomous social science, um, also wrote a book um, called Intellectuals in Developing Societies, um, which was published in 1977. Um, where he talks about um, what is today called public intellectuals or, or public, uh, what is known as public anthropology or public sociology. Um, uh, and, you know, talks about the, the, the necessity of uh, intellectuals to um, engage uh, the public. Um, and he himself actually um, was very much engaged with the public uh, in terms of um, giving, uh, not only giving talks um, to academics, but, you know, he gave a lot of talks uh, to, um, uh, you know, to members of the public. He had many columns, both in English and in uh, Malay language, um, mm. in different uh, newspapers. Um, so I think um, being involved in, uh, you know, decolonizing knowledge, um, you know, means um, decolonizing in general, and not just you know the the two and a half uh, academics who who read our our yes. writings, uh, and I think it requires a skill of being able to translate um, uh, you know our academic articles um, into um, you know um, more semi-academic or more journalistic pieces that can be understood by um, the common you know by by the lay mm. by the reasonably intelligent lay person. Right. All right. Hmm. All right. Thank you for those points, uh, Professor Alatas and Professor Guillermo. I think uh, it's uh, only salient that we end on that note on engaged scholarship because our third keynote speaker 
uh, is very much involved in uh, community organizing and development work uh, in Mindanao. So thank you, Professor Guillermo, for your keynote uh, presentation.